UX. And we have wonderful Paul Borg, the one and only, this joining us This is very today. bizarre that I'm sitting here yeah, talking I know, like this. Yeah, I know, isn't it? Doesn't this feel really awkward and uncomfortable? For me, not at all. All right, well, ask, ask your question. Oh, I'm going to ask the question later. Yeah, yeah, right. let's do so that. So I'm going to jump right into questions. Yeah, go uh, for it. So, Paul, you are a user experience designer, a strategic user experience designer. Yes. You I, I don't know what the difference is, really. So you pretend to know what you're talking about yeah. when it comes to UX. That's the difference, yes. That's the difference. All right. So we see, like, many companies... <laughs> it's going to be very hard for me. No, this is <laughs> um, You see many companies kind of moving towards trying to create this wonderful, uh, beautiful, delightful experiences for customers, yeah. right? Yeah. But what you see as well is that very often it's not like a company's dedication. It's more like the user interface is speaking this wonderful, delightful language, right? Yeah. But at the same time, customer service isn't quite yeah. on it's track. It's a bit, bit poor. Right. So um, how do you actually make a big organization which kind of wants to move to this wonderful space? <laughs> it's really hard for me um, to create delightful experiences. But how do you move them? towards you know, this yeah. design-driven approach? Slowly. I mean, it can, come, it can come in two, one of two ways. It can come from the top down or the bottom up, right? right? When it comes from the top down, for, so senior management turn around and they say, we're going to do this, this is really important to us. They tend to be a little bit vague on the details. Mm. So then it becomes um, for, the, for middle management and the people on the ground to essentially say, OK, you want to do this. That's great. Wonderful. This is how we need to do it. And right. I think oftentimes people on, you know, on the ground floor are a bit afraid to kind of suggest to management how it should happen. But actually, if management give the go ahead, great. Unfortunately, in most cases, that doesn't happen. In most right. cases, senior management don't get it. They don't understand the value of user experience. So it needs to start at the bottom. Right. And in those kinds of situations, the first step is you need to find like-minded people, people that think and see things in the same kind way. Kind of unite you. them to yeah. all things So instead of fighting the battle by yourself, there are other people with you. Then the second stage is to kind of, kind of write almost like a manifesto Mm -hmm. This is how we're going to do things. This is how we think the company should oh, Very work. much like design principles created by designers, right? Exactly, yeah. And then after that, you can maybe start prototyping what a better experience would look like. You know, so what would it, what would it be? Because telling senior management, you could talk about great user experience, um, you know, as long as you want with senior management, but they don't necessarily get it. Mm -hmm. So you need to show them it. Right. And then the final tip I would give you is, is appeal to their selfish gene. So there's a great article article from Jared Spool that says why I can't convince your exec or why you can't convince your executive of anything and neither can I. And his basic argument in this article is you can, don't talk to them about user experience. They don't care, right? But what they do care is about you know, meeting their targets. They care about getting their bonus. They care about keeping shareholders happy. They care about more sales, all those kinds of things. And a great user experience can achieve all those things. You just so, have to show how exactly it can yeah, be done. Yeah, you right. need to talk about the benefits user experience can provide to the organization rather than focusing on, well, it's really important we keep all our users happy. Right. I see. So you have to make it kind of me measurable, right? Yeah. But at the same time, um, would you say that it's always better to just do something instead of asking for permission? Yeah. Well, to, to a certain point, right? I think oftentimes one of two things happens. Either people kind of go off and, you know, they've heard of the, the quote that says it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Than permission. So they, they go off and do what they want. Now, that's ultimately just going to piss off senior management, right? So you can push that so far, but not too far. The other thing is everybody sits there, you know, waiting for permission and never giving it. They maybe go to manager and they say, am I allowed to do this? Well, manager, management's job is saying no to ideas, right? That's the, the majority of what they do. So you've got to hit that sweet point where essentially you maybe prototype, demonstrate, show something. Then you go into management and you show them that. So, for example, recently um, Disney spent a billion dollars. It's the Austin Powers number, isn't it? A billion dollars going into... Uh, 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 redoing all of their parks to support magic bands. Now, I won't go into why magic bands are great, but they're a great user experience tool. Imagine going to your senior management and asking for a million dollars. You know, you're not right. going to be able to do it. So what they did is they prototyped the idea. So they got a warehouse. They, they basically made a mock-up park out of cardboard boxes, right? Um, and, and then they took senior management around and showed them what the experience would be like. Very rough and ready, very dirty, you know, quick and simple prototyping. But it was enough to enable senior management to picture what, what that is going would to be like. like. Yeah, exactly. Rather than just uh, showing like the 
Yeah, that's the skeleton of you know, on paper. Yeah, right. or writing a business plan or yeah. something like that. All right. Interesting, but also when it comes to this kind of amazing, delightful experiences, right? Uh, it feels like we have two camps when it comes to web experiences or native or whatever, where we tend to either have companies that focus really heavily on metrics. Yep. They're going to test everything, every shade of every color yeah. of every button on you know everything, like comparing, kind of testing red against blue and yep. against black and so on. And on the other side, we have companies that try to do more design-focused approach, so to say, where they say, we want to delight. Yep. So we're going to insert a level of delight, or kind of a touch of delight, in every single interaction. Yeah. But the problem is, while the thing on buttons is measurable, you can just measure it right away. Yeah. Conversion rate, you, can, you know exactly, like if you have enough traffic, yeah. you'll know exactly to do A or to do B. Yeah. But with delight, how do you measure the light? Are there actually metrics that you can use? Well, or there, is, like, there is. Or is it too fluffy and? To some degree. How do you, how do you, how do you actually sell the light? Right? Yeah. To some degree, um, you can measure it. You can use things like the net promoter score and various other kind of, you know, how, uh, and, and um, testing against brand words or the perception of, um, you know, a brand consistent with, with what you want as your brand value. So, yes, you can to some degree. But metrics. You've got to be careful with metrics. I'm a huge fan of measuring everything. I think it's really important to do, but you, you can't let that dictate a design, all right? So I'm a great believer in letting the designer have the freedom to, to experiment, to try stuff, see what works, and then you use metrics to measure or not whether or not that is working effectively or which of multiple approaches would work better. So I kind of tend to lean that side. The other thing you've got to be careful with delighters, delighters are wonderful, but you've got to remember, don't let them um, confuse, right? So sometimes we can be so... Clever. So clever, yeah, yeah, so showing off that actually we make the experience difficult to use. I mean, we were talking about this recently when yeah. we were looking at your own website. Um, and there were some things you were doing where I was going, well, I don't understand what this is anymore. You've been so clever, so fancy with yep. your words, I don't know it. But then other times you'd added just a little, little nice little thing in that made me smile and, well, one stage, laugh out loud. So yeah. that's what a good delighter should do. It shouldn't get in the way of usability, but it should, you know, make you smile. Right, all right, excellent. Um, now, going back maybe to the strategies you described in the beginning, yeah. right, where you said, well, we can start actually doing something in the team instead of just waiting for the permission. Um, do you, can you recommend any, and I know one, uh, guerrilla strategies, <laughs> tactics uh, that you would say, do that and you'll see results yeah. right away? There's one, there's one that amuses you, isn't yes. there, that I gave in a talk recently, and I'm giving again here, which is um, we all produce things like personas, empathy maps, user journeys, and we produce all these things and then they get shoved in a drawer somewhere and forgotten, don't they? Which is just really rubbish. We can do better than that. So make them attractive. MailChimp did this with their personas. They turn them into gorgeous posters, right? Turn them into a gorgeous poster, frame them up, and then sneak into your office at night. So if you're watching this, this is what you're to do, right? You're to go into your office at night with these beautiful frames. Go and take down all of those pictures, right? All of those pictures of executives shaking hands and those fancy buildings and those meaningless awards. Take them all down in the middle of the night and put up things about the customer instead. Because when people come in the next day to the office, they're going to see all of this kind of well, what's all this stuff about the customer? It gets them talking, it gets them thinking about the user, they'll wonder who did it. Yeah, so anything disruptive like that. Change everybody's screensaver to be a, you know, to be a, a, a kind of promotional thing for the, for, for the user experience. Use any opportunity to plaster the user everywhere. So, and you're not taking any credit or responsibility no, no, no. if that person is going Do to get secret. in trouble. Yeah, no, if you get in trouble, that's entire. If you get fired, that is your problem, yes. Oh, that's but very do nice it. of you. All right. Um, now, we also have these new things, the so chatbots, conversational interfaces, yeah. VR, AR, AI, all the things that you want all, to talk all about. The, all the acronyms. All the fancy acronyms. Yeah. Uh, what does it mean? What do they mean for design, for UX? I'm really excited about them, and I'll tell you why. Because I think it will change what we mean by designer, 
right? At the moment, we think designer is all about push pushing pixels, all about screen user interfaces, and actually being a good designer is a lot more than that. It's about, it doesn't stop. The user experience doesn't stop at the edge of the screen, does it? So neither should our job. If we're going to call ourselves user experience designers, right. we need to move beyond the edge yeah. of the screen. I also feel like we kind so of don't sung. Don't ignore your flashy thing. Yeah, the flashy okay. thing. I don't know. Uh, we have a couple See, of I things, wrapped so. up beautifully at that. Yeah, you're very good at yeah. this, actually. Uh, we also have one quick question. But what I want to say is, I feel like every now and again, maybe like over the last five or 10 years or so, kind of moving, we've been moving out from this little idea of designing on a screen, this wonderful picture on a screen, towards designing experiences. Yeah. And now we're kind of broadening it even further, when it's more about service design and customer service and social There's stuff. So much and all this, yeah. Yeah. All of so this is kind of, seems like we're kind of moving in broader. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Patrick. What tool should I be using for metrics? Would you suggest Google Analytics? It doesn't even matter. Um, there's lots of different tools, basically, depending on the type of metrics you want to do. I'm a huge fan of multivariant testing, as you are. But that only works if you've got enough traffic coming to your site. You know, Obviously, if you're someone famous like Smashing Magazine, you have billions of people turning up every 30 seconds. So it works well for you. But if you've got a smaller site, the metric I would start doing usability testing is great, you know, um, and uh, Google Analytics is great. But Google Analytics won't necessarily give you the context of why somebody is doing what right. they do, mm -hmm. and it can be quite overwhelming and confusing. So there are other great services out there. Full Story, for example, is a, an app that allows you to watch users interacting live on your site, live on your yep. site which is great uh, for learning stuff. Um, but yeah, Google Analytics is great, but don't get caught up on the vanity metrics. It's not all about how many people have come to your site and how long they've stayed. Right. Uh, two more questions. A quick answer is 30 seconds each. Right. Uh, we have a solid UX culture for web design, but our help desk and training teams don't have those skills backing from management. Thoughts on how to build them up? How to build up your, first of all, recognize they've got the worst job in the world, which is dealing with customers on the end of the phone. Secondly, value their opinion, right? Listen to them when they tell you what the common things are that users struggle with, because they are the ones that are talking to users on a daily basis. So the best way to build most people up is just to listen to them. All right, OK. Uh, we have a question from Valentin. Um, how do you adapt to the management knows? What if whatever you're proposing is being rejected all the time? How do you actually find your way? This is because you're getting demotivated. We've got, we've got to apply the same principles to management we do with users, right? When we start looking at um, a project and we, we look at the users, we want to know what questions do they got, what tasks do they have, how do they feel about stuff, what are they trying to do, what are they trying to achieve. We don't apply any of those principles to our management. We need to understand what makes our management tick. And once we understand what they tick, then we can make sure that what we present meets their agenda. So they're not going to reject something that is already their own idea. Do you know a really good place to start is in those, um, uh, those strategy documents, those vision documents right. that all companies put out. 2020 vision, right? It's normally filled with a load of guff. And as designers, we just shove it in a drawer and forget it. But if you can tie your projects to those goals that senior management want so to achieve. So kind of achieve, sell, uh, try to sell your idea as selling the yeah. Of helping to achieve this it vision. achieves their goal. Right. So, and you'll find that they're a lot more receptive when you do that. All right, excellent. Uh, we have more questions coming. Maybe if you have time, you can answer I can later. I can as long as you want. Um, so, just the last one is so, which statement do you agree with? Data informs design or design informs data? Data forms design. Informs. Informs. Data informs design, design informs both. That's a quick because, answer. Well, it's the, it's the truth, mine. You know, I think, um, obviously, as we design, the, the design decisions we make will influence how people behave, which will influence the data. Right. But equally, the data, listening to what users are doing, because that's essentially what the data is about, or should be about, should be understanding users and user behavior, then that should inform the design. Where the line comes is a, a recognition that data is great for usability stuff, can somebody find this, et cetera. I don't think it's as appropriate for what color should we should use. Because there are lots of ways of communicating um, other than just color, you know, and right. getting the right kind of feel. OK, excellent. Uh, we have a new book coming up soon. I do. Funny you mention that. As we don't have time for it. But as you're publishing it. <laughs> yeah. User Experience Revolution is a, is a book essentially about how to change your organization to take design and user experience seriously. 
Buy it from all good retailers, in other words, Smashing Magazine. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. So now walk away. All right, go away. Thank yeah. you so much, Paul. Uh, you're welcome. Right. Excellent. That was